Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence in this case will show that on the night of August 25th, 2020, here in our community of Kenosha, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was 17 years old at the time, had armed himself with an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle loaded with 30 rounds in the magazine. And using that rifle, he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, an unarmed man. The shot that killed Mr. Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum and confronted him while wielding that AR-15. The evidence will show that the defendant fled the scene of the dead body of Joseph Rosenbaum without stopping to offer any aid whatsoever. And as he's running, word spreads from the crowd on the street that there is an active shooter running through the area. And the citizens there attempt to stop him. They approach the defendant. They One person hits him in the back of the head. One person takes a swing at him with a skateboard. That individual is Anthony Huber. Eventually, the defendant loses his balance and falls to the ground. An individual who is the subject of count number two, the unknown individual, runs in at that point and attempts to kick the defendant in the face while the defendant is on the ground. This unknown individual is unarmed. The defendant, in response, points his AR-15 directly at this individual as this individual is literally flying over his body and discharges that gun twice. Luckily, that individual was not hit. But clearly, if he had been hit, the wound would have been severe and perhaps even fatal. Immediately after that, Anthony Huber, who is holding a skateboard, comes in and reaches for the defendant's gun. He grabs hold of the gun and tries to pull it away from the defendant. The defendant is wearing his AR-15 strapped to his body. There is a nylon strap around his entire body, and the gun is slung from that. So it is essentially attached to him. Mr. Huber's efforts are unsuccessful because of that strap. And in that struggle, the gun winds up pointed directly at Mr. Huber's chest. The defendant pulls the trigger one time and discharges a round into Mr. Huber's chest, killing him instantly. A final individual by the name of Gage Grosskreutz has followed this chase on foot and has approached the defendant at this time. Mr. Grosskreutz is holding his cell phone that he'd been using to record the night's events for a live stream on Facebook in one hand and a Glock semi-automatic pistol in the other hand. He runs up to the defendant. The defendant turns towards him with the AR-15. Mr. Grosskreutz raises his hand. The defendant then turns his rifle over, begins to examine it for a second. Mr. Grosskreutz takes this opportunity, and you will see in the photos and the videos, that he blades his body with his left hand reaching towards the defendant. His right arm is pulled back. This is the gun, one with the gun in his hand. And as he's reaching for the defendant, the defendant turns the AR-15 and discharges the eighth and final round into Mr. Grosskreutz's right arm, the arm with the gun. Mr. Groyskreutz runs off, screaming for a medic. The defendant gets up and walks away. On that night, he killed two unarmed people, shot at a third at very close range, and wounded Mr. Groyskreutz in the arm, who was armed with a gun. It is the state's position that this evidence demonstrates the criminal charges against the defendant, his intentional homicide of Anthony Huber and his reckless conduct towards the other defendants. Now, what I've just given you is the snapshot, but there's a wider context here. As we all discussed yesterday, this occurs during the context of the events following the shooting of Jacob Blake, which occurred on Sunday night, August 23rd, 2020. And we all know that within a short period of time after that, the community erupted in protests. 
looting, rioting, arson, and violence. Sunday night and Monday night were two of the roughest nights that our community has ever seen. We are well aware of the damage that the uptown area along 22nd Avenue suffered. The probation and parole office on 60th Street, the furniture business there, Car Source, one of their locations on Sheridan, and other properties around town that were damaged. Fortunately, in the entire sequence of events, this was all property damage. And one of the things we all agreed on yesterday is life is more important than property. Up until Tuesday night, despite all of the things that the community had experienced, no one had been killed. But what happened as the time went on was that the people of Kenosha, who felt a sense of outrage, began to protest. But like moths to a flame, tourists from outside of our community were drawn to the chaos here in Kenosha. People from outside of Kenosha came in and contributed to that chaos. And it caused many of our citizens to fear for their safety, fear for their homes and their families, fear for their businesses, and take steps to protect themselves, whether it is to arm themselves, board up their windows, move or take time away from the community. All of those reactions were entirely understandable and reasonable. And no one here is going to tell you otherwise. As long as those are what you're left doing, there's no issue. But out of the hundreds of people that came to Kenosha during that week, the hundreds of people that were out on the streets that week, the evidence will show that the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. The evidence will show that hundreds of people were out on the street experiencing chaos and violence, and the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. We will show you videos of some of the events that night of police, tear gas, rubber bullets, and yet the only person who killed anyone was the defendant. There are fireworks going off, which is a loud noise, sounds like gunfire. There are fire, guns being discharged, the sound of gunfire throughout our community that night. Hundreds of people are there experiencing this, and yet the only one who kills anyone is the defendant. We will show you video of hostile confrontation between literally hundreds of people on one side of the issue and on the other side of the issue. People getting up in each other's faces. And yet the only person who killed anyone is the defendant. Hundreds of people experienced those nights, experienced the night of August 25th, experienced that chaos. Hundreds of people. And yet the only one who killed anyone is the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Recently I heard someone sort of tongue-in-cheek joke that jury service is bringing in folks from our community and paying them eight dollars a day to help solve a murder. We're not asking you to solve a mystery in this case. In most homicide cases the elements that I need to prove might be a little challenging, but here there's no doubt, there will be no dispute in this record that the defendant had that gun that night, shot eight bullets, four of them hit Joseph Rosenbaum, two of them at an unknown individual, one into Anthony Huber's chest, and one into Gage Grosskreutz's arm. That will not be in dispute. The central issue in this case is going to be self-defense. And the judge has given you an instruction which I want to highlight here, because there are some factors that I'd like you to keep in mind when you hear the evidence in this case. The defendant used deadly force. There is a privilege under our laws to use deadly force, but it's a very limited privilege. That privilege, according to the law, indicates that the defendant can only use deadly force if he reasonably believed that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. In determining 
whether or not those beliefs were reasonable. The standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must, must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of his acts and not with the benefit of hindsight. You are essentially the people of ordinary intelligence and prudence who will apply that standard of reasonableness to the defendant's behavior and make a determination as to whether or not his use of deadly force was reasonable. Was it reasonable for the defendant to believe that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself? So, let's talk about the context of that evening. And I'm going to try and go in a little bit of chronological order to set things up for you so you understand the evidence as it comes in in this trial. The first witness you're going to hear from in this trial is a man by the name of Dominic Black. Dominic Black was, at the time of this uh, incident, dating Mackenzie Rittenhouse, who is the defendant's sister. And through Mackenzie, Dominic Black got to know the defendant. And they spent a lot of time together in the months leading up to August 25th, 2020. In fact, on May 1st of 2020, Dominic Black bought the AR-15 for the defendant. That occurred up in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. Dominic Black used money that was given to him by the defendant to go to an Ace Hardware up in Ladysmith and buy the gun in Dominic Black's name. Now you might ask, why was it necessary for Dominic Black to do that? Why couldn't the defendant do that? Because the defendant was 17. And Dominic Black and the defendant knew that because the defendant is 17, he cannot purchase a gun. He cannot legally own a gun. And so this was, in effect, a straw purchase on behalf of Dominic Black, on behalf of the defendant. After the gun is purchased in Ladysmith, Dominic Black and the defendant spend a little time up there at Dominic Black's family's hunting property. And they fire both that AR-15 and one that Dominic Black already had. And the two of them are practicing using their AR-15s at a shooting range that they have on that property. And Mr. Black will tell you some more about that. Then they agreed that that gun would not go home with the defendant to his home in Antioch, Illinois. It would stay here in Kenosha at the residence of Dominic Black's stepfather in a locked gun case. And in fact, after the two of them returned from Ladysmith in early May of 2020, the gun stayed at that residence here in Kenosha until the day of August 25th, 2020. On the night leading up to August 25th, that Monday night, the defendant stayed over at Mr. Black's residence here in Kenosha. And the two of them decided on that next day, Tuesday, August 25th, that they would do something about what was going on in Kenosha. So at point, one point earlier in the day, they come down here. They work on cleaning up some graffiti on some buildings here downtown. Then they decide they want to come back later that night and protect a local business, a business called Car Source, which is located at 59th and Sheridan. Now, as I talked to you a little bit about yesterday, Car Source actually has three locations very close in this downtown area. One of them was on the east side of Sheridan Road, at 58th and Sheridan. And either on Sunday or Monday night, I think it was on Monday night, August 24th, that entire property was pretty much destroyed. There were multiple cars in the parking lot that were set fire and completely burned out. The building itself was damaged as well. Right across the street from there is another car source location that also sold used cars. And some of those cars had been damaged on the night of Monday, August 24th. So on Tuesday, when the defendant and Mr. Black are out and about, they encounter one of the owners of car source. And they talk to him about protecting their 59th Street location that night. And there's some discussion about that. In the afternoon, Mr. Black and the defendant go out to Jelinski's out on Highway 31, Green Bay Road and they acquire straps so that they can sling those guns around themselves when they come back to the downtown area that night. And eventually, later that evening, they return. They meet up with some other folks that are interested in protecting car source. Originally, they start out at 63rd Street Car Source, which is the third and final car source location. But then they agree, 
we're going to go to the 59th Street, 59th and Sheridan location, and protect that location to make sure no one damages the cars, no one damages the property. And I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with that. Protecting that property is entirely lawful, totally understandable, and it's something that many people here in Kenosha did. And there's a group of people, including the defendant and Dominic Black, that take up positions at 59th Street. Some of them, like the defendant, are on the ground in the parking lot, where as people are walking by in the street, they're having interactions with these people. Dominic Black will testify he took up a position on the roof. He did that because he didn't want to be on the ground, close to where other folks were, close to where potential issues might arise. He wanted to stay a little bit removed from all of that. Didn't want to get directly involved in it. You will hear and see videos of a sequence of events going on around Kenosha that night. The evening begins with large-scale protests, large-scale, um, no other way to put it, rioting that's occurring right outside these windows, right in front of the courthouse here at Civic Center Park. There is a crowd of police that have lined up to protect this building, to protect the public safety building, which is right next door. And there are a large number of protesters that are agitating. They are screaming at the police. They are throwing projectiles. Police are shooting rubber bullets, tear gas, etc. It is a very volatile situation at Civic Center Park. Now, that's at 56th and Cherry, about three blocks north of the car source where the defendant was. But as the evening goes on, the police decide to move the line of protesters south on Sheridan. And eventually, they pass the car source at 59th and Sheridan. The police establish a line at 60th and Sheridan, one block south. Now, as that process is going on, many of these protesters pass by the defendant and the people that he's with at 59th Street. Words are exchanged. There is confrontation. There is a little bit of hostility. No one is hurt. No one fires a gun. No one is injured. But clearly there's antagonism. It is clear that this is a crowd that is not on the same side as the defendant, that does not see him as an ally, does not see him and his group as someone that they identify with. And as I said, there is a hostile inter exchange there for a while. In fact, at one point, members of the crowd pull one of the dumpsters from the property out into the street and attempt to start it on fire. And some of the other folks that are there with the defendant go out and put the fire out and have some very harsh interactions with those people in the street. I believe the evidence will show that it is this process that demonstrated for the defendant that this is a crowd that is not a safe crowd to be in. This is a crowd that does not view him as an ally. This is a crowd that if he ventures out into it, there could be problems. Now, once the police pass by and the protesters are pushed down south of 60th, I believe the evidence will show that the car source that the defendant is stationed at is no longer in danger. There's no one there who's attempting to damage the property. There's no one there who's going to do anything to harm anyone there. The situation has moved on. Does the defendant stay there? Does he decide that he's done what he set out to do and it's time to go home? No. The evidence will show that the defendant, another individual in the group by the name of Ryan Balch, who you will hear from, decide to venture out into the crowd. They cross the police line at 60th and Sherry, and they walk amongst this group of hostile protesters. At some point, they both wind up at a gas station on the southeast corner of 60th and Sheridan called Ultimate Gas. And you'll see some video of the scene there. It is a scene, again, of groups of people that are clashing with one another verbally. There's some shoving going on. And in the midst of this is Joseph Rosenbaum. And you will hear some testimony about Mr. Rosenbaum and his activities that night. Mr. Rosenbaum had been discharged from the hospital that very day. 
and had come back to his home of Kenosha, had met up with his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart. He couldn't stay with her, so he left her and came downtown and got caught up in the midst of these protests. You will see him on videos. You will see photographs of him as he's walking around. He is carrying a plastic bag. Part of that plastic bag is clear and see-through. It has a string, white string, drawstring to it. It is the type of bag, I believe the evidence will show, that you get at the hospital when you're asked to put all of your personal possessions in a bag. Your shoes, your watch, your phone, your jewelry, etc. That's the type of bag it is. And I believe the evidence will show that he was carrying it around most of that evening. And at very, various points, the evidence will show that Mr. Rosenbaum is agitating. He is getting in people's faces. He is using obscenities. He is essentially daring people to respond. In fact, at ultimate gas, I believe the evidence will show that he actually gets right up in the face of armed people who are similarly armed as the defendant, who have similar AR-15 type rifles on. And he is literally confronting them in their faces. None of those folks shoot him. They push him away. He's five foot three, by the way, 150 pounds. They push him away. No one appears to take him as a serious danger. The defendant is at the ultimate gas station during part of this. So is Ryan Balch. I believe Mr. Balch will testify that there was an understanding that when we cross south of 60th, we stay together. We try not to intervene in anything. But if we get separated, head back to 59th Street, where our original group is. Mr. Balch does. The defendant attempts to. He comes up to the police line. They won't let him pass. He says, I work at that business, and points to 59th Street. And again, they won't let him directly through the line. Now, I believe the evidence will show that he could have easily gone a block in either direction if he really wanted to go back, but he turns away from the police line, returns to the ultimate gas station. And a few minutes later, we see him on the video of a man by the name of Corey Elijah, who will testify very shortly here in this trial. Mr. Corey Elijah was one of these people out on the streets who was Facebook live streaming the events of that night. And he catches the defendant passing right in front of him with a fire extinguisher. The gun still slung around his body, strapped to his body. And Corey Elijah will testify, this caught his attention. What? Where is he going with this fire extinguisher? And so Corey Elijah decides to follow with his video, recording the entire way. And we will show you that video. You will see that as Corey Elijah leaves the ultimate gas station at 60th and Sheridan and heads south, he passes by the defendant, who by this point is walking, holding a fire extinguisher in his hand, all by himself. Corey Elijah, I don't think, registers that that's the person I originally saw, and he keeps on passing him, and as he continues, he passes by Joseph Rosenbaum, who at this point has taken his shirt off. He's got shorts on, and he's taken his shirt and kind of wrapped it around his head. And Mr. Rosenbaum is still carrying that plastic hospital bag and walking down Sheridan towards the 63rd Street car source. The defendant is behind him at some distance. As they get down to the 6200, into the 6300 block of Sheridan Road, that block on the west side of Sheridan has a house right at the corner of 62nd and Sheridan. And then on the south end of that block, the south half, is the car source lot. You will hear testimony from someone from the FBI who was up in a plane that night taking video. And we will show you the video. It is an infrared video, which means it picks up heat. This is at nighttime, so regular cameras, especially from an airplane, aren't going to be able to see everything. So the infrared helps us to see in the dark. The video picks up Mr. Rosenbaum. It is quite clear to see him because he is a white blob. Infrared picks up heat. He doesn't have his shirt on. So the cloth of a shirt would help conceal some of that heat, but when you don't have your shirt on, that heat radiates, and the infrared picks it up more clearly. So he's very easy to see in the video as a white dot. You see him running towards the 63rd car source, and behind him, running in the same direction, following him, is the defendant. As they get to the 63rd Street car source, there are some cars on the north side of that lot. Mr. Rosenbaum peels off behind those cars, and the defendant stops on the other side of those cars and turn to turns towards Mr. Rosenbaum. 
Now, obviously, in an infrared video from a plane overhead, we don't know exactly what was going on at that very moment. We don't know what words were said. But what's clear is whatever that confrontation that was initiated by the defendant started, it caused Mr. Rosenbaum to come around the cars and start running after the defendant. The defendant drops the fire extinguisher right there and runs, carrying his AR-15. At some point during that foot pursuit, the defendant turns around, points the gun at Mr. Rosenbaum, who puts his hands up in the air. Now remember, he has got no shirt on. He's got his hands up in the air, almost like, what are you going to do? The defendant stops, pointing at Mr. Rosenbaum, continues to run. And right around this time, there is a gunshot from someone else who we have identified by the name of Joshua Zeminski. This is an individual who's walking on the sidewalk, probably 30 feet away from where the defendant and Mr. Rosenbaum are running. Mr. Zeminski, for reasons only he can explain, decided to take his handgun and fire it one time in the air. As I said, this is in a different direction and many feet away from where the defendant was. Mr. Rosenbaum continues to pursue the defendant, and we will have Detective Martin Howard testify that he's timed the, the gap between Mr. Zeminski's shot and the eventual gunshots is about 2.5 or 2.6 seconds. Mr. Rosenbaum closes on the defendant. The defendant turns and fires four shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. You will hear the testimony from the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner, Dr. Douglas Kelly, that Mr. Rosenbaum suffered five wounds total from four bullets. Dr. Kelly will testify that the first two wounds that were inflicted upon Mr. Rosenbaum were to his lower extremities. We're not sure which order they were in, but one was to his right pelvis, fracturing his pelvis, and one was to his left lower thigh. Dr. Kelly will testify that these wounds caused Mr. Rosenbaum to start falling face forward. And you will see video of his body where it is found. He lands on his face, face down on the ground. As he is falling, falling the defendant fires two more shots. One of them hits the defendant in the back, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum in the back. And that is the shot that kills Mr. Rosenbaum, according to Dr. Kelly. You will hear testimony from someone by the name of Richie McGinnis. Richie McGinnis is a reporter who came to Kenosha to cover the events of that night. And at some point shortly before these shootings, he encounters the defendant at 59th Street and interviews him. He talks to the defendant and then follows the defendant down Sheridan Road and is right behind the defendant as these shootings are occur. In fact, he is in the car source lot. He is behind Mr. Rosenbaum when Mr. Rosenbaum is shot. And Mr. McGinnis will testify that one of those rounds came close to him, which is the basis for the count that we've alleged that Mr. McGinnis was uh, recklessly uh, harmed or, or placed in danger by the defendant. Mr. McGinnis will testify that when he saw Joseph Rosenbaum shot and fall to the ground, he immediately ran up and attempted to treat Mr. Rosenbaum. He took off his shirt. He used it to try and stem some bleeding. He rolled Mr. Rosenbaum over onto his back, and he's attempting to administer first aid. Many other people respond at that very moment to that location and attempt to help Mr. Rosenbaum. They eventually lift him up. They carry him across the street to Freighter South, formerly known as Kenosha Memorial Hospital, KMH, which happens to be right across the street. These folks load him into a hospital SUV that's there in the back of it, and it races off towards the emergency room to try and save Mr. Rosenbaum's life. That's what Mr. McGinnis does. The defendant, after shooting Mr. Rosenbaum, gets on his phone, calls Dominic Black, and says, I just shot somebody, and starts running away. Now, one of the things that you will see and hear in this case is that the defendant, throughout this entire evening, held himself out as an EMT, as a medic, that he's carrying a medical bag with him, strapped to his body. And yet, in this time of Mr. Rosenbaum there on the ground, injured, potentially dying, 
the defendant offers no aid, but instead runs. He runs up Sheridan Road. He encounters another member of their group from 59th Street, who you will hear testify by the name of Jason Lakowski. Jason Lakowski is similarly armed. He's a former Marine. He had been with the defendant at 59th Street and had come down in response to the gunshots. Mr. Lakowski will testify that he met Mr. Rittenhouse as the defendant was fleeing the scene. And Mr. Rittenhouse said to him, I didn't shoot anybody, but I need help. And Mr. Lakowski says, head up towards the police. So the defendant starts running north on Sheridan. The crowd starts yelling, that guy, the defendant, just shot somebody. Because that's all the knowledge they have at that point. And it's true. So they begin to chase after him. They clearly believe he's an active shooter. And they try and stop him. And I've already described to you the events that follow. Mr. Huber, the unknown individual, and Mr. Grosskreutz. So, when we talk in this trial about the nights of August 25th, we need to keep in mind the context of that night. We need to keep in mind the fact that there were hundreds of people on the street that night experiencing the same chaos, the same loud noises, the same gunfire, the same arson, the same tear gas, the same hostile confrontations with people who believe the opposite of them. And yet, out of these hundreds of people, only one person killed anyone that night. Only one person shot anyone that night. When we consider the reasonableness of the defendant's actions, I ask you to keep that in mind. Now, in this trial, you are going to hear from a number of witnesses from the state. I've already told you about a few of them. We are going to begin the testimony with Dominic Black, and he will tell you a little bit about the acquisition of those guns. You will hear from Corey Elijah, who was live streaming the events that night. You will hear from Detective Martin Howard, who worked diligently to gather evidence, including many different videos, many different uh, photos of the scene that night. We are going to use that television to show you these things so that you can see them yourself. I know many of you alluded to the fact yesterday that you've watched or read things about this. You will get the full story here in the courtroom, and you will see some things that have not been made public yet. We intend to do that by moving the TV as central as we can so that you can see it as up close and as well as possible. And we will show you as much as we can about those night, about that, the events of that night. You will hear from the FBI individual who was in the plane taking that infrared video that shows the defendant chasing Mr. Rosenbaum and initiating that confrontation. You will hear from other individuals who took video that night. You will hear more about Joseph Rosenbaum from his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart. She will tell you about his hospital stay. She will tell you about that bag. She will tell you about what was in that bag. You will hear about Anthony Huber. You will hear that he was a skateboarder, that he lived for skateboarding, that he was at the skate park at Penoyer Park all the time, that he actually knew Jacob Blake personally, that he came out that night because he wanted to show support for his friend, Jacob Blake. You will hear what sort of person Anthony Huber was. You will hear from other witnesses who have been affected by that night. You will hear from law enforcement witnesses who did a lot of investigative work to assemble all of the evidence against the defendant in this case. And you will hear from Dr. Douglas Kelly, who will testify regarding the cause of death of Anthony Huber, the gunshot wound to the chest, and you will hear that the shot that killed Joseph Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. And based on all of that evidence, I think you will agree with me that the defendant is guilty of all of these charges. Thank you. You've heard the state's opening statement, and now I will give mine. We have two very different outlooks on the events of August 25th of 2020. Kyle Rittenhouse was present in Kenosha, Wisconsin on the evening of August 24th. He stayed at his friend's residence, Dominic Black. He saw on the live streams and things like that the events of the 24th. 
he saw a car source number one as I refer to it the one that's on the east side of Sheridan Road burn all of the automobiles burn destroyed he saw the looting going on he saw the other businesses burnt down and the next morning he went down to downtown Kenosha to look at the damage he stopped and he helped clean up at the old Ruther High School I think it's called something else now but when I was around here it was called Ruther and before that Bradford and he saw that he met one of the owners from car source and they talked and they decided that they would offer their services, him and Dominic Black and Nick Smith, to help protect the property of car source. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show, in spite of what the media and public statements and things like that have been, the evidence will show that Kyle Rittenhouse had strong ties to Kenosha. His father lived in Kenosha. His mother lived in Antioch, Illinois. Kyle worked here in Kenosha County at the Recplex in Pleasant Prairie as a lifeguard. He went downtown to clean up the graffiti. Him and Nick left there, and they decided to come back that evening and help car source Lot 2, which is at 59th and Sheridan, and initially car source 3 at 60th and Sheridan. And when they were doing that, they met other individuals who had come to town at the urging of websites and things like that, and then just a general, I would say, distaste for the destruction. And those guys from the West Bend area, Ryan Balch, Lakowski, Joanne Fiedler, agreed that they would all help protect the car source lots. And initially, they went to the lot at 59th early in the evening. And what will end up being, you will see the events of that night unfold in video and still photographs. But ultimately, what this case will come down to, it isn't a who done it, when did it happen, or anything like that. It is, was Kyle Rittenhouse's actions privileged under the law of self-defense. That is, that the defendant believed that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with his person. The defendant believed that the amount of force which he used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference and that his belief was reasonable. You as jurors will end up looking at it from the standpoint of a 17-year-old under the circumstances as they existed on August 25th of 2020. And Mr. Binger makes a big thing out of Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who shot somebody that evening. True. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. This is Joseph Rosenbaum. And what's important in this photograph is one, it will allow you to identify him throughout the course of trial. Notice the belt, the baggy, lengthy jeans, and there will be a fair amount of testimony, I'm sure, regarding the maroon shirt. He's obviously currently wearing it. Mr. Rosenbaum was at a location, and Mr. Rosenbaum had, along with other individuals, started a dumpster on fire. And when somebody put that dumpster that was very close to a gas station out, Mr. Rosenbaum became enraged. Sound on. That's just a brief snippet of that interaction. 
And he was upset, and he's yelling that he wants to be shot. And you'll see individuals in the full video, which you'll see in the course of trial, holding him back, trying to stop him from getting at an individual who is dressed with a baseball cap, an AR rifle, and long pants, excuse me, short pants, who looks very much like Kyle Rittenhouse. Here's Mr. Rosenbaum during the evening. Him and his friend or associate, Joshua Zeminski, had just come from starting a trailer on fire. He arms himself with a chain and goes up and down Sheridan Road, carrying this rather heavy chain used to tie down equipment. Next is a still photograph taken from the ultimate gas station where he was shouting, shoot me nigger, shoot me nigger, at a Black Lives rally. Who is that behind him? Joshua Zeminski. The evidence will show that Mr. Zeminski, also named as Alec Blaine, and Mr. Rosenbaum are together throughout the evening. And Joshua Zeminski plays a central role in this scenario on August 25th. One, creating chaos and havoc with Mr. Rosenbaum. And two, more importantly, when we finally get to car source number three, Mr. Zeminski is the individual who fires the first shot that evening behind Kyle Rittenhouse as he's being chased by Mr. Rosenbaum. Here's a picture with two circles. Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Zeminski starting the trailer on fire on Sheridan Road along with a dumpster. You see the photograph, the second one circled. The testimony will show that that is, in fact, Mr. Rosenbaum wearing a blue mask, not his shirt over his head, and carrying a bag, which I'm sure there will be much testimony about. Other individuals in this, once again, Mr. Zeminski, in the photograph taken at the ultimate, this is a still from one of the videos you'll get to see, is Mr. Zeminski armed with the weapon that he ultimately fires at the car source three. The individual with the red hair is Kelly Zeminski. She has a backpack and there's a circle on her hand with a big, heavy flashlight. As you can see, there was no need that evening for a flashlight other than it being a weapon. Count two is an individual by the name of Richard McGinnis. He was a reporter covering the riots in Kenosha. He had covered the riots in Portland, Minneapolis. And he will tell you what he's called to the witness stand by either the state or myself, that he was dressed like this that night. The black t-shirt with the white back, the helmet on his head, and he had interviewed Kyle Rittenhouse and talked to him. And Mr. Balch and Rittenhouse were going to go out and see if anybody needed medical attention that evening. And Richie McGinnis was going to follow along. He will testify that he goes out with them. And eventually they have an interaction with the individual who we refer to as Yellow Pants Man. This is Gage Grosquitz, the individual who is the victim, or excuse me, the complaining witness in count five. I apologize. And in that photograph, you see that he's wearing a backpack and he has his cell phone in his hand as he does throughout the evening filming. Photograph 10, excuse me, the next photograph, is the evidence will show Gage Grosquitz running down Sheridan Road, and you see his hand going into the back of his waistband, pulling out a firearm to arm himself. The evidence will show, through testimony of an individual by the name of Nathan DeBruin, that that yellow dot right up there is where Kyle Rittenhouse is as they chase him down Sheridan Road. Mr. Grosquitz 
is not in any danger. Kyle Rittenhouse has already told him that he's going to turn himself into the police, yet he arms and continues with the mob to attack. This is a picture of Anthony Huber, the individual who attacks my client as he's laying on the ground after being kicked in the head by Jump Kick Man with his skateboard. He hit him with the skateboard as he was running down Sheridan Road, and then as he's laying prone on the ground, he comes in for another hit on his head and then grabs Kyle Rittenhouse's firearm to try and take it away from him. The next photograph is a picture to look at the whole skateboard, the size of that skateboard, the trucks of that skateboard. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to be able to hold up that skateboard in front of you as evidence today because then you could see it. You could see the weight and the heft of what a skateboard is. And what that skateboard would do is somebody takes it in their hand and swings down on somebody's shoulder, head, and neck, trying to separate the head from the body, as Mr. Huber did. But Your Honor, I'm going to object to the argument here, Your Honor. This is, this is straying beyond a characterization of the evidence, and it's Mr. Richard's interpretation as an argument. You'll see the photographs, you'll see the videos, and ultimately you'll get to make the decision of what Anthony Huber was trying to do. The skateboard doesn't exist because Ms. Giddings, his girlfriend, in spite of repeated requests by Detective Howard, refused to produce it. That's what the evidence will show. Mr. Huber at the ultimate gas holding back Mr. Rosenbaum who is ultimately the individual who lit the fuse that night. Man I refer to as jump kick man or the non-complaining witness. Kyle is laying on the ground after being knocked to the ground by an individual hitting him out of the rock, Anthony Huber hitting him with the skateboard, and jump kick man comes in kicks him square in the face with his black boot. Close-ups of that. And as he's kicking him in the face, Kyle fires two shots at that individual. He's not hit. He gets up and he runs away into the night, never to be seen again, never coming forward to identify himself as a victim complaining witness or otherwise to law enforcement. We looked for him, the evidence will show. The state looked for him, the evidence will show. Those are the big players in this case. But ultimately, what you'll end up having to decide, looking at all the circumstances of that evening, are the events that occurred over really a brief 15-minute period, but more importantly, three minutes. The police spread or push people south to approximately 60th. That's something we can agree. There's no line set up to stop Kyle or anybody else going in a southerly direction down Sheridan Road. There's no statement that if you go in that direction, you can't come back if you have business in that direction. Kyle, an individual by the name of Ryan Balch, followed by Richard McGinnis, go down there, Sheridan Road. And at 1140, they have a conversation yelling medic. And you'll see the videotape of this event. Kyle's got his medical bag, his gun, and he comes upon these three individuals. And the individual in the yellow pants accuses Kyle Rittenhouse of pointing a laser sight from a gun at him. Kyle shrugs it off, does not want confrontation with these individuals, does not point his firearm at them, and he leaves. Why does he leave? Because he doesn't want trouble. These are the three individuals who are with Yellow Pants. One individual is carrying a noose. I don't know what that's for. 
The other individual, the testimony will be from Kyle Rittenhouse and Richie McGinnis, had rocks in his hands, and then the blue-shirted individual was carrying a 9 millimeter firearm. Richard McGinnis will tell you about the marauding nature of these individuals. He was so intimidated by them after Kyle walked away that he had to give up two white claws to him to settle him down and some cigarettes so that he would be able to leave them. Kyle, from there, realizes he's been separated from Mr. Balch. He goes over to the ultimate gas station looking for Mr. Balch and is unable to find him. What happens next is he attempts to get back to car source at 59th and Sheridan Road. This is Kyle on the right coming into the frame. let him pass. He goes back to the ultimate gas station and a few minutes later at approximately 1145 he receives a phone call from Dominic Black. Dominic Black informs him, the evidence will show, that they're breaking windows and starting fires down at Car Source 3. Go and stop them. He asks an individual for a fire extinguisher and ask the individual to go down to car source three with him. The individual gives him the fire extinguisher, but does not go with him. And Kyle heads down to car source three. He doesn't know that Mr. Rosenbaum is down there. He's been asked to go down there by Nick Smith. He heads down Sheridan from 60th, walking to Sheridan and 63rd where the car source is. That's a picture of him from a video leaving the car source at 11.46 p.m. approximately. He has his firearm, and he has, as you can see in his other hand, a fire extinguisher to put out the, picture, the fires and, that are being started down there. This is an aerial photograph that the state had referred to in its opening, and it's actually started to roll and you'll see circles in here. There's Kelly Zeminski in the green um, lettering, and that's a thermal energy en image, excuse me. I don't think I did start. It starts very slowly. You can see people are labeled Richard McGinnis, Richie McGinnis, and they head down. see Mr. Rosenbaum come around from hiding in the cars, beginning to chase my client. You'll see the flash of the firearm from Mr. Zabinski, and you'll see the flashes of his first shots. I am not responsible for cutting this video. I don't know how it got the way it did chopped up. That's the FBI up in the plane that took this video. But it's very telling because you'll see this a hundred times. I'm not going to go through it again for you in opening. But you'll see it that the individuals are heading down Sheridan Road and you'll see this Mr. McGinnis is now over here go and hide right in this location. You'll see Kyle come into this area and pause where Mr. and Mrs. Zeminski are. And you'll see in this car is a fire that's starting. You'll see how it's bright. And they go, Kyle runs in this direction, trying to get away from Mr. Rosenbaum. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Rittenhouse is under no obligation whatsoever to retreat from 
Mr. Rosenbaum. He does. He runs away from him because he doesn't want a confrontation. He doesn't want trouble, which makes no sense with what the state says about him hunting or chasing him down. He's trying to get away from the individual. You'll hear testimony, not just from Kyle Rittenhouse, but Balch, Mr. Balch, about Joseph Rosenbaum stating to Kyle and to Ryan Balch in each other's presence, if I get either of you two alone, I'm going to kill you. Flat out threats to murder. When Mr. Rosenbaum is shot in the car source lot three, there's been a gunshot behind Kyle. He turns to address Mr. Rosenbaum with his firearm. Mr. Rosenbaum is not deterred. He continues to run. And you'll see that on numerous videos, closing the distance. Mr. Rosenbaum could have stopped at any time. Mr. Rosenbaum is wearing that maroon shirt on his face as a mask, covering up his identity because he wants to steal my client's firearm and use it against him to carry out the threat he had made earlier. That isn't just the word of Kyle Rittenhouse made up after the fact. You'll hear the testimony of Richie McGinnis, who was close that evening. He was following behind him. You'll see him on the video. He'll testify to you in court. He did not feel endangered. He was doing his job. He will testify that Joseph Rosenbaum let out, as he put it, one of the scariest screams I ever heard, yelling, fuck you, and dove for Kyle Rittenhouse's gun. Kyle Rittenhouse fires. He fires four shots at Joseph Rosenbaum. The state wishes to slow everything down into a microsecond. Those four shots, the evidence will show, took 0.76 of a second, 76 hundredths of a second from first shot to last shot. Those shots will be put, those measurements will be put forth by Dr. John Black, who's a certified video examiner. He breaks every frame down. He knows how much each frame takes. He counts the frames and he comes up with that time. Next photograph, 1148, that's car source three. You see an individual right here with his hand in the air. The evidence will show that's Mr. Zeminski. This is Mr. Rosenbaum in full stride running after Kyle Rittenhouse. This is a still from a video. And you'll see a lot of videos leading up to this. You'll see a video, I believe it's from Corey Elijah, where he's confronted by Mr. Rosenbaum. And he doesn't want a confrontation. And he goes, you'll hear it on the video. The video is not showing that confrontation. But you hear Kyle's voice. And he goes, friendly, friendly, friendly. He thinks, because he's giving medical attention and helping people out, that people don't have an animosity against him. He's wrong, but that's the belief in his head, and Mr. Rosenbaum chases after him. And I believe that the state will want to say, why did he go down there? He went down there because Nick Smith asked him to. Why didn't he keep running? One, you don't have to run, but two, I'll show you a video from 63rd looking back onto the car source lot taken by an individual who will testify and his daughter. Next photograph circled again 
Zeminski with the arm up, Rosenbaum in full stride chasing, and an arrow pointing to Kyle. This is the video from 63rd and Sheridan Road. You'll see that whole video during the trial. The individuals were at car source, the rioters, destroying all of those vehicles. And as Kyle was running from Mr. Rosenbaum, he did not want to run into those rioters who were destroying all of that property that did not belong to them. You hear the first gunshot, the evidence will show Mr. Zeminski. You hear four shots in quick succession. The evidence will show that is Kyle firing at Mr. Rosenbaum as he's trying to take Kyle's weapon from him to use against him. You hear three more shots in quick succession. I don't think the government will have any dispute. I don't think the evidence will dispute. Those three shots are from another person who's in the car source lot firing for some reason. He was never identified, never arrested. This will show Kyle running back to the scene of the shooting. And it will show, I think the evidence will show, why Kyle Rittenhouse didn't stay and render aid for Mr. Rosenbaum. Not that he's under any obligation to do that, but sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. <laughs> The individuals who are yelling, he just shot him, shoot him, and you can see one of them with a gun, Mr. and Mrs. Zeminski. He begins running down Sheridan Road. He's not taking his gun. He's not threatening anyone as he's running down Sheridan Road. He's running in a southerly, excuse me, I always get my directions confused, a northerly direction from 63rd towards 60th. What is at 60th? The evidence will show that is where law enforcement is, and that's where somebody would run to be protected from a mob that wants to kill him. The evidence will show this next video taken from Gage Grosquitz. He runs up to Kyle. At this point, he is unarmed. Kyle does not point a firearm at him, does not do anything to dissuade him from approaching him. You'll hear on the video the exchange, and you'll see it. Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Hey, stop him! You see him running with the gun at the ground away from Mr. Grosquitz. Mr. Grosquitz came up on Kyle, got very close. Did Kyle point a firearm at him? Did Kyle shoot at him? No. All he wanted to do was get to the police. But the mob is closing in, of which Mr. Grosquitz is a member. The first individual runs up behind Kyle and hits him in the head with his hand or a hand with a rock in it. This yellow circle shows Kyle being knocked a bit askew, but more importantly, his hat being knocked off. He's run all this distance, his hat stayed on his head. The government doesn't want anyone to think that he's being attacked or hit. This still photograph shows that his hat is being knocked off. That's the first blow to Mr. Rittenhouse. He continues to run. The testimony will show that these individuals are running up on him. What's important in this photograph, the evidence will see, show, is 
On the left, the testimony will be that Mr. Huber is picking up his skateboard. Why is his skateboard on the ground? Because he has taken his skateboard and swung it at Kyle Rittenhouse's head for the first time, hitting him in the head. And you can see in the blue circle Kyle Rittenhouse beginning to fall down. The two red marks are one, the individual who struck him first, and jump kick man closing in. Kyle goes to the ground. This is a still photo from a video you'll see. What's important here, the evidence will show, it's an individual. Kyle's on the ground within two feet. Kyle points the firearm at him, does not fire. The individual backs up. He's no longer a threat. Kyle does not discharge his firearm. The next picture, the unidentified complaining witness, jump kick man, kicking Kyle in the face. Behind jump kick man is Huber. Now he's picked up his skateboard. This is a photograph from a different angle, a different individual. And you see him running in Kyle's direction. There's the boot right before contact. Those are the boots that struck Kyle Rittenhouse in the face. Here is the photograph. Mr. Huber's bare hand on the skateboard, holding the trucks, bringing it into contact with the back of Kyle Rittenhouse's head. Jump kick man still has not even gotten completely on the ground. And where is Mr. Huber's hand? And it's important here, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bare hand grabbing his gun. The state will produce evidence, I believe, that there's no DNA on the gun. He must not have touched it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's video photographic evidence of him touching the gun. Next, the bare hand pulling the gun towards him. Jump kick man getting up to run away. You can see a close-up, the bare hand on the gun. Kyle Rittenhouse flat on his back in the most vulnerable position one can be in. There the strap is pulled tight. Mr. Huber's trying to pull the gun away from Kyle Rittenhouse as he's laying flat on his back. Kyle's afraid he's going to be disarmed and shot with his own weapon, the evidence will show. He fires one shot, striking Mr. Huber. In this photograph, just entering from the right, the evidence will show his Gage Grosquitz. One hand, a phone. One hand, a firearm. Here's Gage Grosquitz with his hands up. Kyle Rittenhouse does not fire. Look at the distance between them. Huber skateboard has not even hit the ground yet. That's how fast all these things occur. Mr. Grosquitz does not stay in that position or back up. He moves in on Kyle, getting closer, pointing the gun almost directly at his head. As the state said, he's like this, but look at where the gun is going. The gun is in the circle. It hasn't got directly to pointing at Kyle's head, but it's going there. Kyle fires once, hitting him. Another individual approaches after Gage Grosquitz has been shot, puts his hands up. Kyle Rittenhouse does nothing. In that events, in event number two, the whole event from first shot with Mr. Grosquitz, excuse me, jump kick man coming in and getting the two shots to the time Gage Grosquitz is shot in the arm is about five seconds. You'll have exact times of those shots, how fast it occurs. And after the shooting that evening, Mr. Grosquitz was interviewed. He told law enforcement 
his story of that evening. The one interesting detail he forgot to mention was that he was armed when he got shot. He told the police that he had lost his gun as he was running down Sheridan Avenue. He didn't know that there were up people out there like him videotaping and photographing everything. He had a gun in his hand, and that's why he shot. His statement says that the reason he went into the fray was because he had to stop Anthony Huber from beating Kyle with the skateboard. At 11.51, Kyle has gotten up. There are individuals around who are in that area who've come at him. He's pointed his firearm, backed them off, and he continu continues in a northerly direction down Sheridan Road to 60th. hands up, approached the police car to turn himself in. The evidence will show that the police told him to get away from the car and go home. The police say that they pepper sprayed Kyle. Kyle didn't get hit with the pepper spray. He's not disputing that they might have shot pepper spray at him. That's why he backed up so quickly. He finally makes his way to car source 2 back at 59th, meets up with Dominic Black, the individual who sent him down to car source 3, tells them about what had happened. Dominic Black, I believe, will testify that he saw him. He was white as a ghost, sweating like a pig, and he was explaining what happened, saying he had to do it. It was self-defense. They talk about going home to Antioch. Dominic Black takes him home. They leave about 10 to 12, and at 1.20, Kyle Rittenhouse and his mother are walking into the Antioch Police Department, turning themselves in to the police, which is what he wanted to do here in Kenosha, but the way Kenosha was that night, with the police department surrounded by fence and things like that, he couldn't. He turned himself into law enforcement. He said from that day what he did. He's made no bones about that. He acted in self-defense, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence will show that his actions on August 25th of 2020 were reasonable under the circumstances as they existed that night being attacked by Mr. Rosenbaum. The evidence will show, and the law is clear, he didn't endanger those other individuals. The government can refer to him all they wish as an active shooter. The only person he had shot was Joseph Rosenbaum, who had made threats to kill, had made numerous statements about ripping people's hearts out. He wasn't afraid to go back to jail. And Nathan DeBruyne will testify to some of the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum that night. And he'll testify, and it was one of the more telling statements, I thought, in a statement. If there was trouble that night, Joseph Rosenbaum was there. And that's ultimately who visited himself upon Kyle Rittenhouse. The evidence will show he thought, probably, that he could get that gun from Kyle Rittenhouse. He was wrong. Kyle Rittenhouse protected himself, protected his firearm so it couldn't be taken, used against him or other people from Mr. Rosenbaum who'd made threats to kill. And the other individuals who didn't see that shooting attacked him in the street like an animal. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the evidence will show. Thank you.